Okay, so welcome everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, welcome to the second webinar in the advanced topic series. Uh, and this one is on scripting in BigCurator. Uh, and um, this was amongst uh, a number of topics that uh, BCC members said they would uh, be very interested in learning more about uh, what other members are doing, um, how they've been um, working uh, within the BigCurator environment um, and using scripting tools and strategies to help uh, do their, their work better. Um, so uh, Diane Dietrich from Cornell University and Jarrett Drake from Princeton offered to share their own experiences with scripting as um, an initial way to uh, uh, get the, I guess, get the conversation started more um, about uh, how to go about scripting uh, within Big Curator. Um, so as far as the sort of structure outline for, for the webinar, uh, both uh, Diane and Jarrett are going to start by sharing a bit about their own local institutional context, their own position um, within their institutions, um, and you know, how that offered uh, some opportunities um, uh, to meet some needs related to their work. Um, they're going to talk about the specific a specific problem that uh, they were uh, faced with and how they addressed that addressed that problem uh, with scripting techniques. Um, and then they're, they're going to talk about the details of the specific scripts that they implemented, even in uh, brief form. Um, and then Diane's going to give a little bit of an insight into sort of how to get started with scripting and what we've talked about in the the preparation for this initial webinar is uh, making this uh, part one of two webinars and a second version would be uh, more tutorial based and more in depth um, in that how to get started with uh, scripting zone. So just, just wanted to plant that seed there. Um, and so each of them we're going to talk about 15 or 20 minutes each. Um, so we'll have uh, plenty of time for uh, Q&As at the end. And I think it would also be great um, if others have other experiences they'd like to share um, with their own uh, implementations of, of scripting within the curator. Uh, and then, you know, both Cal and Cam are here as well to maybe answer any specific questions around uh, other ways of incorporating scripting into your activities with MVIC Curator. Um, so with that said, just a couple sort of uh, housekeeping protocol things. You are already doing this, but uh, since we are recording the webinar uh, to be able to uh, post and make publicly available on the BCC website uh, after, after this session, if you could go ahead and keep your, your mic uh, muted uh, unless, unless we get to the Q&A part and you want to ask questions. Um, in the meantime, there's the chat box. Um, uh, so feel free to start entering questions in there at any point. Uh, we can get back to them when we get to the Q&A session. So with all that taken care of, I'm going to go ahead and pass the uh, ball over to Jared to get started. Sorry, hold on, Jared. One second. Okay, you should have it now. Go for it. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for attending. Uh, I have to say this is my first time doing a webinar um, as a presenter, so this is really awkward and it might suck. So my apologies in advance if that happens. Um, but uh, I'm the my name is Jared Drake. I'm the digital archivist at Princeton. Uh, I've been here about two and a half years. Um, and so really the focus of my presentation, is, as Sam stated, is to talk about how and when I started scripting in Big Curator and what successes uh, and failures I've had. It's that second part that I think is really important to, to discuss. Um, before I actually, whoops, see, I was thinking this is the PowerPoint and I hit the, the next button, but that doesn't work. I have to click this next page. Um, so. 
before I start talking about security in particular, I'll just very briefly address the different responsibilities I have here because I think it's important for us to know um, each other's context because these are things that have worked in my context but may not work in others. Um, so I have a wide range of responsibilities within my repository, the University Archives, within the library and within the field overall. Um, my background is that I earned a bachelor's in history uh, and a master's in information science with a focus on archives and records management. So if you don't already know, it should be evident that I do not have any formal training or education in scripting or actually anything technical. Um, so be uh, fair warned that some of this may be very obvious to you, um, but uh, I thought it was important to step back. Um, and really I highlight that um, I do reference here in my repository because it's really from that combined experience of both creating EAD finding aids and also answering reference questions from the public about those finding aids uh, that has helped me uh, understand what users need. Um, and I really strongly advocate for all archivists and librarians to engage in reference if possible because it's really that intersection of those two responsibilities um, of technical services and public services that led me to think about what kinds of basic information users would need um, to, to discover, access, and later use born digital archival records. So from looking at, at our finding aids here from the public viewpoint, I knew that there was a need to, to do archival description for born digital records a lot better than what we had been doing. So I have three parts to this. Um, in part one, I'll describe the three motivations, three motivations for why I began scripting. In part two, I'll offer two big challenges I experienced when I started, and I'll, and I'll also share how I overcame those challenges. And lastly, in part three, I'll provide one example of a script that we at Princeton have been using to extract and manipulate basic data to incorporate into our EAD finding aids. And if at any question, uh, if, it, if at any point you have a question, uh, please do throw it in the chat box. I'll see it and, and I'll stop. And actually, that will probably help this uh, be less awkward, actually. <laughs> Okay, so the motivations. So when processing born digital records, I needed to, I knew that I needed to avoid using graphical user interface file browsers. Um, Windows Explorer is the one for Windows, Finder is for Mac, and Nautilus for Linux. Um, I knew I needed to avoid those for a whole host of reasons. Um, the first is that Taking actions on thousands of files in GUI file browsers is unstable and time consuming uh, and presents issues of scale scalability for larger volumes of content. Uh, the second reason built off of the first is that when processes fail um, in using a GUI file browser, it's hard to know why uh, your process failed and where exactly it went wrong. Um, the third reason is that uh, moving things and, and around in GUI file browsers is not forensically sound, um, and I'm sure in the Q&A, Cal and, and Cam can attest to that, um, because file system metadata can easily become corrupted before any original metadata is documented. And I just want to pause and say that it's not that some file system metadata won't change over time when doing digital curation. That's not true. Um, things will change over time as, as media is refreshed, but I think it's important to capture and document that original metadata. Um, and using a, a graphical user interface file browser um, makes that a lot harder, if not impossible. Um, and, and finally, everything that you can do in a GUI file browser can be done via the command line interface, uh, and usually quicker and more responsibly, and uh, most importantly, it can be done very transparently through the creation of log files. So um, avoiding GUI file browsers was sort of the first motivation that I had to begin scripting. My second motivation uh, was to avoid dependency hell where possible. Um, I was trying to think of a metaphor for like what dependency hell is. Uh, dependency hell makes regular hell feel like the North Pole. So that's the best I got. Um, dependency hell is way hotter and with many more interdependent layers. There's jar hell, there's DLL hell and RPM hell, which are specific forms of the same general frustration with software packages that rely on too many external dependencies that require separate updating and maintenance. And while it's impossible to process born digital archival records and not use prepackaged software apps, 
Installing software on Linux, as some of you likely know, can be a very steep learning curve. Um, and also the frequency of updates to operating systems can impact those different dependencies and complicated processing, um, which is especially difficult if multiple workstations are in usage. So for instance, here at the University of Archives in our library that we share with the public policy papers, we have one primary workstation, uh, FRED, and we have two secondary workstations that are laptops. So maintaining all up-to-date synchronized software applications across three different workstations is pretty difficult. Um, so avoiding this dependency hell where possible is the se second motivation that I had to, to begin scripting. Okay. And the last main motivation that I had to begin scripting is probably the one motivation that moved me to scripting more than the others did combined. Um, and that motivation was to identify and extract precise descriptive data from born digital archival records. So for born digital collections with deep nesting, um, we had no precise method to create a simple container listing with a basic title, date range, and a file folder count. Um, our practice for creating those three pieces of information was very manual and susceptible to considerable human error because although pr our processing manual included an intellectual step for description, we didn't yet have an associated workflow for doing that description, which is understandable and likely the case in many repositories. So even if the processing archivist managed to find those three disparate, disparate pieces of data, the finding aids produced uh, during this manual process still had room for improvement and clarity. Um, so before I actually dug into scripting, um, I knew I wanted to do the following. I knew that I wanted to extract file names and have those, um, and, and, and folder names and have those become unit titles. Um, I knew that I wanted to extract modified dates of oldest and newest files and plug those into unit date values. And lastly, I wanted to extract file and folder counts and insert those into extent values. So I had all of these needs, but I didn't have a clear path forward. I mean, I'm apolog I apologize for the contrast here. I don't know what the heck happened. Um, but I can, I can send out my slides uh, later to everyone and they won't look as terrible as these two. Um, so I had all these reasons to begin scripting, but I really didn't know where someone with a non-technical background should get started. Um, it, I don't know if you've ever seen those, those charts that say, here are the things that uh, I know that I know, here are the things that I know that I don't know. And I was in that category of like, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and the issue wasn't that there was a lack of sources from which to learn, but the issue was how to decide which sources were reliable and would meet my needs and not have me down a rabbit hole. Um, so I didn't start this journey by beginning to look for how to write scripts specifically. I sought more basic resources to learn uh, more broadly about computer science and how computers work. Um, so the, the first source that I turned to was actually um, edX. And um, I signed up for, for, to audit three different classes. One was an introduction to Linux class, which I'm sure is probably still offered. Um, and also um, I signed up to audit two different computer science classes, one from MIT and uh, one from Harvard. Um, and these classes were helpful in different ways. And even though I didn't feel the need to actually complete them in their entirety, they helped me gain a little bit of confidence about the functionalities of computers overall um, and they exposed me to the various scripting languages, and most importantly, how those scripting languages relate to one another. Um, so I could very easily weed out certain languages because I knew those weren't problems that I was trying to solve. Um, the second place that I turned uh, actually was to uh, take myself back to school in a way. Um, the, uh, the, the main source of that was going to the home pages of different information schools um, and seeing what kinds of syllabi they had um, for classes. You know, when, you, when you're in library school, all the classes look interesting, but you don't have that much time to take all the classes. So um, I know that there are things that I missed out on, so I wanted to, to try to shore up that knowledge gap. Um, and actually, the, the syllabus that helped the most, uh, I did not plan, like I'm not just saying this just to say, like it really helped me the most, um, was a class that was taught by Cal Lee. 
um, and that class was Understanding IT for Managing Digital Collections. Um, so I found the syllabus, and uh, I actually ordered the main text for that class, How Computers Work, and I just read through it over the course of the month. So they gave me a lot of background and just how computers are, are generally, um, how they generally operate. So um, after getting through the, the different edX, uh, modules and the, the uh, syllabus um, from Kyle's class, uh, I sought out dedicated Linux tutorials um, due to the fact that BitCurator is a customized Ubuntu Linux operating system. Um, I started with the Linux documentation project, um, which has several different guides. I started with the introduction and then moved towards the module on Bash for beginners, which is uh, in Bash, it should be stated, is the default shell scripting language in Linux. Um, I spent quite, also spent quite a bit of time on the site linuxcommand.org, which helped reinforce some of the concepts of the documentation project and convinced me that the Bash scripting language could help me solve my problem of extracting DID data from born digital archival records. So, after overcoming those challenges of figuring out how I could actually get started um, learning and, and implementing, um, the next really big challenge was finding a place, a time, and a means to practice with uh, Bash scripting language. Um, I had access to a Linux environment um, on the FRED because we put BitCurator as uh, the operating system on the FRED, but I didn't feel comfortable testing there because I was scared that I was going to break something or blow up something, which may or may not have happened in other contexts, but, you know has been proven. So um, also still had a lot of other responsibilities here, including in-person reference, processing paper collections, papers not going anywhere, um, and also meeting with lots of offices and departments um, to, to smoothen out acquisitions of foreign digital records. So I really didn't even know where this time was going to come from. Um, but in any case, I just started out by trying basic things on my personal laptop, which is a Mac. Um, I spent time reading the manuals of uh, specific commands. So this manual that you, this top screenshot that you see is um, the manual to the find command. Um, I set up Outlook appointments with myself and I committed roughly about five hours a week for about six weeks to learn and whatever I could. Um, I also invited colleagues from other repositories at Princeton to learn with me um, and we just sort of developed like a community of knowledge. And I really think that both of these experiences, practicing independently and collectively, helped me gain confidence to keep learning um, because the online sources are plentiful, but the in-person sources are scarce. So those names that you see listed um, in that second screenshot there, uh, that's actually from the, from the Outlook uh, calendar. Um, and it just reflects the, that we really took this uh, as something that we could learn uh, together. So now I'll just move into uh, one brief example of a bash script that we use here. We use a, a series of different ones, but I thought I would, would talk about the one that we've been using. Um, oh, oh, sorry, someone sent me a message. I'll listen to everybody. Um, but um, so yeah, I just thought we would go over one of the scripts in a little bit of detail before I pass it off to Diane, who's um, going to uh, go in a, little, a lot more detail about scripting, because she's awesome. Um, so this is one script that we use in the Big Curator environment that meets that third motivation that I mentioned earlier. Um, first off, before I say anything else about the script, there have been many hands who have helped in this. Um, we've had two separate summer fellows who have helped in this. Um, we've had one programmer and myself. Um, and that doesn't count how many different people have tried this out and seen ways that it hasn't worked. Um, different colleagues here at Princeton have, have tried it out and it's worked or not worked. So all of the different hands who have played a role in this um, uh, really uh, have a lot of things. And it took a while to get to this point. Um, but at its core, this script is a loop that strings together three of those basic questions and outputs and answer into a text file. Um, so you'll see, I don't know if this pointer here is actually working or anything, um, but you'll see at the top, 
uh, all bash scripts start with the shebang. Um, and the next few lines, I actually really don't know what that means, um, to be honest with you. Our uh, programmer helped us with that. Um, but we just set a, a variable. We say um, only that option max depth one, um, we're, we're telling the script to only go one level deep. You could remove that and it could print out all of the directories. But um, for our use case in University Archives, we say we only want to go to max depth of one. Um, and then we move down uh, into the scripts. Obviously, the things, the the lines of the script with the hash sign are commented out, just like in in other um, types of of uh, app software applications. Um, but we're basically asking for the uh, the name of each directory or folder, uh, the modified time of the oldest file recursively, um, and the modified time of the newest file recursively, as well as the number of directories and files. Um, and so initially, all of these. Like this really came together organically, um, and uh, they came together as separate pieces, and the script just sort of helps connect all of them together. So the out I mentioned that the output of this is uh, a text file and a screenshot of what you see at the top of your screen right now. Um, so after a series of quick data transformations, that top screenshot eventually gets transformed to that bottom screenshot, which is um, the, the finding aid view. Um, and we get a nice and neat representation of, of that did data in EAD. Um, this process has shaved considerable time off of processing and been way more reliable and accurate than, than previous methods. Um, oh, and this is also a good time to state why in the previous slide um, I, I highlighted the max depth of one, um, because as you might surmise, the discipline folder, which has 17 folders beneath it, um, is arranged by students' names. So um, the max depth of one was in, uh, placed on that script in order uh, that we not violate FERPA, which is bad for a number of reasons, one of which is we'll get sued. So there's that. So um, my advice to anyone who wants to get started uh, with scripting is to first and foremost uh, find your purpose for why you want to do it. Um, some of the exercises that I've gone through in different learning contexts has been really hard to figure out how that meets my use case. So I really think finding out what you need to do better and what you can do better um, is, is, is the first step. Uh, the second thing is to find your partners, whether that be remotely through different learning, online learning communities. Um, edX is just where I turn. There are tons of other things out there. Um, and I think it's important to have in-person partners as well. I think uh, gathering with, with my colleagues here has been really helpful and, and talking with people with different, um, uh, I'm going to the big curator list and um, getting uh, feedback on, on different things has been really helpful. And the third thing is just to find your path. Um, it won't be easy, it won't really be convenient, um, but you just have to start trying things and see what happens. Uh, you will make mistakes and that's okay, that's really, really when the, when the learning um, actually happens. So um, with that, I will pass it back to Sam, who can pass it on to Diane. Thanks, Jared. Uh, that, was, that was really great. Uh, um, really good to see uh, sort of the whole, the whole picture from, from start to where you're at now. Um, so Diane, you should have privileges now. Okay. All right. There we go. Hi, everyone. So yeah, I'll I'll start my 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 part. Um, my name is Diane Dietrich. I'm the digital projects librarian at Cornell, and as of today, we're part of the Bitrier Consortium, and I'm really psyched about that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, just like Jared, about my background and some motivation for why I started scripting with Bitcurator. And then at the very end, um, I'll have sort of a quick start guide to, to things. Um, but first, I, I want to start off with my background because it's a little bit different. Um, I'm no surprise that I'm kind of a geek. Uh, my background is math, and I took a lot of computer science in college. And one of the things that um, I had to do in computer science classes was we had to do all of our labs on Linux, I'm sorry, on Unix machines. And I got to say, like, even harder than the programming itself, figuring out how to use Unix was a really big challenge. It was just as hard as doing the actual homework. So 
I decided to enroll in a class while I was still in college um, called Computational Physics 1, which had nothing to do with physics. It was basically a class on how to use Unix. It was like a crash course in Unix and the command line and bash scripting, lots of bash scripting. So I kind of have that background that I bring from, from undergrad. And in library school, I also took a class in Perl uh, on data analysis, and it was all about taking large amounts of messy data and scripting it to make it better again. Um, so that's kind of my educational background in terms of like what, what brought me here. But I also want to mention that another important part of the story is that um, when I was in college, I decided to actually start using Linux as my main operating system. And so at that time, a lot of my friends were like, in camps, right? You were a Mac person or you were a PC person. And switching to Linux was kind of a way to be a little bit of a rebel, to do my own thing. It was kind of fun. And I got started using this distribution that was like super minimal, right? You installed it and you didn't even get a graphical interface. I just threw myself right into the deep end. But one of the things that I took from that experience was that I got to pick my environment exactly the way I wanted it. I got to position every single thing on the screen exactly the way I wanted it. And that sort of mindset of your computer is here to do what you want and you can customize it infinitely is things that I brought when I started working with BitCreator years and years later. So with all that background said, my the rest of my talk is in two parts. So the first part is how I basically got into the business of crafting metadata from vintage Apple file systems, because I already told you I'm not an Apple person. Um, and the next part is a quick guide to jumpstart your own adventures scripting. So off we go to the first part, which is crafting metadata from vintage Apple file systems, or when life gives you HFS, you can make it DFXML. So before I start with that part of the story, Um, I was psyched that Big Curator is built on top of a Linux environment because not just that it was my operating system of choice, but it was it, it represented a lot of possibilities for me. And the way I see it, Big Curator is a lot like an infinite set of Legos, right? You've got your basic blocks, which are really sturdy and predictable, and help you build houses that like won't fall down. But then, like as any room's Lego collection can attest to, like you have all of these little like specialized oddball pieces that you can kind of, uh, oh yeah, Duplo box, that's good. <laughs> oh, that was my roommate set, actually. I built that, the thing on the slide. <laughs> um, sturdy and predictable, and then you all have these like little basic or little specialized pieces that you kind of tack on, and you can create this sort of like infinitely interesting structure. Um, and that's what I thought about when I thought about BitCurator. So you have your basic set, right, of all of the great tools that BitCurator has provided for you. And then you can customize your setup and find individual pieces that match what you need. So how did I end up with my own LEGO creation? So I'll give you a little bit of context about the grant I was working on. So in 2013, Cornell embarked upon a grant. It was called Preservation and Access Framework from digital art objects. And what we did was we selected 100 CD-ROMs from the Rose Golden Archive of New Media Art, which were critical works in the history of new media art from the mid-1990s to the early 2000s. Um, these were in danger for a lot of reasons. First, that CD-ROMs are not bulletproof media. Um, but secondly, a lot of the system requirements that were referenced for these artworks they referenced obsolete hardware and software, you know, old Macs, Windows 3.1, uh, Windows 95, you know, classic environment and Mac, that sort of thing. And for me, at the time, I was actually a science librarian, and I was still a geek, as I am now. Um, and I was part of a lot of initiatives on campus uh, to do research data management creation, right? So I had some experience with, you know, kind of the digital life cycle of things. And this grant came in to the library, and they needed a half-time person for two years to be the technical lead on the project. And I was asked to fill that role. And so I accepted a fellowship in the department that I'm in now, Digital uh, Scholarship and Preservation Services. And I basically jumped in headfirst into hands-on world of digital preservation. 
In our first meeting of the advisory group, I was directed towards Big Curator and all of the infinite possibilities that it presented. And I set up a forensics workstation. Uh, it was a really nice machine with good processors that was a dual boot, Windows 7 and Big Curator. And I ended up mostly on the, on the Linux side and kind of uh, used those tools to do the work that I, you know, that we, that we worked on for the rest of the grant. Um, so, you know, the, the job basically was part programming, being a detective, and being a metadata person. And so I had to figure out how to characterize and analyze all of these disks. So, as everyone knows, uh, artists are inclined to like Apple, um, but we also had some PC-based disks. And these had implications for how we were going to kind of approach the task of, of preserving these. So as everyone knows, uh, I learned the hard way that when you have a lot of HFS, you are faced with a conundrum, right? Um, the sleuth kit, which is the basic uh, utility that underlies a lot of the forensics applications that are in Big Curator, doesn't support HFS because it was built afterwards. HFS is kind of old. And just to back up, just for those of you who don't know, HFS is the legacy file system from Apple, and I believe it was replaced by HFS Plus in 1998. So that gives you a sense of like the time frame that we're working with. Um, and for us, practically speaking, right, it meant that if we wanted to make use of certain pipelines, we had to do it, you know, we, we had some limitations, right? So on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the Big Curator Report screen, um, which, are, you know, represents the pipelines that you can use for PC-based disk images. And then on the other side, you have HFS Explorer, right, which allows you to navigate the HFS disk images, but those two didn't quite talk to one another. So all the really great reporting and the metadata generation that you got out of the reporting tool wasn't connecting to the HFS file system. And for us, we wanted to do metadata right, you know. So we wanted uniformity across all of our metadata. And we picked DFXML because, you know, it's a standard. And it really gave us the ability to express sort of the layout and structure of all the disk images that we had, um, including multiple file system representations. And so what I say by that, we took a disk image, right, of an artwork. And let's say that that disk image represents a CD that you could put into a Mac or a PC. And so you had kind of these, um, these, these disks that had multiple file or uh, software compatibilities, and we wanted to express that all in one metadata file rather than kind of fragmenting it and having one structure and format for the HFS part of it and one structure and format for the DFXML side of it. So the question is, where do you go from here? And here is where I kind of thought back to sort of my overall motivation and approach to dealing with Linux which is basically this is a set of tools that I can add to and connect in order to make what I need. And so the question facing me then was, where are my missing pieces and can I connect them all together? So basically it was a matter of finding the right quirky Legos to put everything together. Um, I actually found HFS utils in the Ubuntu software repository and then found out it was already in Curator which was great, um, and kind of randomly through a digital archiving syllabus, I found this tool called DiskType, um, which at that point was actually not in Big Curator yet, and I installed it. And basically what these two things did, so DiskType basically told you, you throw it a disk image, or and it, and it just tells you what file systems are present, like HFS or ISO 9660, which is the PC, uh, compatible disk image, or uh, sorry, file system. Um, so that was really great. I needed to know what was on these disk images. And then HFS utils basically printed out file system details on the command line. And that was perfect, right? It was a lot better and it was a lot more easy for me to use than the graphical interface because it meant that I could take the output that HFS utils set out and I could redirect it and create DFXML out of it. So ultimately, here's how everything all went together. So the green thing are the things that we wrote custom, and then everything in black there is what was already existing in Big Curator. 
So you start off with a disk image. Disk type will determine the file systems that are present. We also use file to identify individual files within the disk image. Um, depending on which file systems were present, we either had a Python wrapper around HFS utils or a Python wrapper around the SleuthKit utilities, and that kind of uh, produced metadata, which then we redirected to the Python bindings for DFXML and wrote out some really nice, uh, valid DFXML, and it was a script that I called technical metadata.py because I'm not terribly imaginative when I name my scripts. Um, so basically, I kind of uh, benefited from the fact that I had I got to do all of this work in the context of a grant, meaning that I had a lot of time to experiment and a lot of time to test things out and to pull this all together. And at the very end, um, I decided since the scripts that I had written were kind of convoluted, I would clean it up and write it in a way that made sense for other people's workflows. So hopefully, and you can see the GitHub uh, code for, or link for the, the repository there. I've written this in a way that it will hopefully tie into other people's big curator workflows. So I'd be really psyched to hear feedback um, from other people. I put up uh, directions on how to get it how to get it up and running on Big Curator. So that's my experience. Um, you know, making a custom thing out of the pieces that were already available within the Big Curator environment and incorporating things that I found elsewhere. So the next part is a crash course on getting started with scripting. And I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go through just a couple of tips that I think would be helpful to get started. And first off, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. It's not the most intuitive thing to do. And honestly I benefited from all those classes I took and just a lot of practice and like Jarrett said, a lot of failing and a lot of just like figuring out just why something failed. And the thing is that I think that's really great about the environment that we have now is that Big Creator is a virtual machine if you want it to be, right? So you're in luck. Throw some copies of files in there, try things out, and if you break it, just fire up a new virtual machine and, and break it again. I think you're gonna have to break it about five times before you get it, but that's part of the learning process, right? Um, you know, the command line can be really overwhelming, but just remember it's sort of like, it's a new place. It's got a new language, new customs, new new things to get used to, a new set of intuitions to develop. All right, so I apologize for this font here. It was supposed to be a fixed width font, but this is really nice and stylized, so we're gonna go with it. Um, I don't think that you need to write a script to do scripting, so these are some short one-liners that I think you could just do. Um, you know, so basically the first one, create SHA-1 hashes for everything that's ending in MP3 and it puts it in a file. Or if you want to spit out all of the different file identifications and put it in a specific text file. Or, you know, you have a directory of a whole bunch of a hodgepodge of files and you want to move just the .mov file somewhere else. Uh, that's the third one. And then the fourth one is, you know, creating VFXML from Flywalk, which is a command on BigCurator. So, you know, when you're when you're on the command line, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. You just want the answers to sort of where are you and how do I get somewhere else? And so a lot of us are familiar with two two essential commands, right? CD, change directory to like move around within this environment, and PWD, which is print working directory. It tells you where you are, so you know where you're going. And yeah. All right, so Jarrett showed an example of one of his scripts. Let's say you want to do a couple of things of one, at once, and you just don't want to go line by line. Um, how do you do that? So you make a file, right, that has a whole number of commands that you want to issue. The top is that required line. It just tells this command line that this is a shell script. Um, and this one is, say, you have a mix, you know, a hodgepodge of files, and you want to create shell on checksums for all the different types and redirect them to their own separate mm -hmm. files. So that would be an example here. So the first one is freeze and that's their dot move files, and so on and so forth. And once you have that file, um, you want to be able to run it, right? And so what you have to do is you have to tell Linux it's executable, and that's 
something you do from the first command, chmod plus x, and the name of the script that you run. And once you do that, um, you run it by typing in dot slash and the name of your script. And so here's where I think it's kind of tricky. Like, if you're not familiar with this, it can get kind of weird. But I want to explain that, that, that second line really quickly. In Linux, everything's really well organized, right, all the files. And we'll appreciate this because we're librarians. Chances are, so basically, Linux says there are certain prescribed directories where you're going to find executable files. And chances are where you are is in the file system is not one of those places. So you literally have to tell Linux, run the script where I am right now. And that's what that, that dot slash means. So I just want to kind of like demystify that a little bit. It's just a little odd. So now that you're running all of these scripts by yourself, um, uh, I, I think my advice would be to go out on the web and try to find one-liners. I found this, this really long one. I was trying to find the, like, the longest, kind of like most convoluted one I could that was still like kind of approachable. And the idea is that, you know, you take something like this and you try it out on your own system and then you make it better or you change something about it. And I think that's how I really learned to um, going out on, you know, the web and mucking around with other people's stuff. So uh, some confessions. Um, I learned things about scripting while I was putting together these slides. Also, I do things the wrong way, quote, in quotes, all the time. It's OK. If it works, it works. It doesn't matter if someone doesn't think that it's not the best way to do things. Uh, and finally, um, I, I wanted to include some really detailed documentation. Um, it's not for everyone, but for me, really, this, this really helped me out my game. Bash Guide for Beginners, which I believe Jarrett mentioned. Shell Expansion, it tells you exactly how the command line is interpreting your command. So when things go wrong, it can be really helpful to figure out, like, exactly sort of the translation that the computer's doing. And then for those of you who aren't as familiar with Linux or want to get more familiar with it, I actually found the file system hierarchy standard, which tells you like the location of every single thing that should be on your Linux system, really fascinating and really helpful in, you know, getting me familiar and comfortable with that environment. All right. That is the end of my portion, and I'm going to hand it back to Sam for Q&A. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, Sam. Uh, that was that was awesome. Uh, would would it be okay if I shared the link to the the site that you and Jared are starting to put together? Yes, please do. I'm so psyched about it. Okay. Yeah. So maybe maybe you want to say a little bit about that too, as I put it in the uh, window. Uh, sure thing. Um, so Jared and I, in preparation for this webinar, started to put together a number of different one-liners that we found really helpful in Bash. And if anyone is familiar with the FF improviser. A tool which kind of gives you really simple commands, or I'm sorry, not simple, um, a guide to sort of all of these different things for FFmpeg, which is another command line utility. You'll you'll love this. Um, basically, it's a whole bunch of things that you could do, like move a whole bunch of files or find the oldest file in a directory. And we spell out the command that you can use and explain all of the pieces for it. So we're really psyched, and we're really hoping that people can contribute to this, so it can be like a living, breathing resource that everyone can use and build on. Yeah, totally. Uh, I think I think there's lots of lots of room for growth and and uh, incorporation. And this is this is something that totally the you know the BCC community is well positioned to help uh, what evangelize, advocate, <laughs> whatever word you choose to uh, you know consider doing more sort of outreach and engagement with the larger community. Um, and this, you know, I mean, the recording of this webinar will be a piece of that as well, too. So with that, I'll stop talking and open it up for uh, questions from, from anybody who is in the background listening. This is Kari Smith from MIT. Um, 
both Jerry and Diane, a, a question that I have is, you both it's talked about sort of the, you know, just come up with something you want to do and try it, and, and the, you know, comments of the, I'm not sure what I don't know. Um, I think, I, I guess the question I have is, is often when I see someone's script, I, I'm like, Maybe this is just the, I just really need to go back and read that beginner's guide kind of thing, or read a Linux um, basic guide, and maybe this is, that's what you can tell me. Um, but sometimes it's just the point of the, like, um, here's a script. I, I don't even understand the syntax around where am I supposed to start, like what directory do I have to be in to run the script, where does the thing have to be, how do I know where the directories are, how do I find all that stuff, especially when I'm not using the GUI. And is that the kind of thing I think that the guides like the basic Linux guides are telling you, or is that part of the trial and error, just trying to understand where things are on your directory? Um, this is Diane. I can I can take a stab at it. So one of the things I think I think it's like a trial and error thing. I don't often find the guides helpful in terms of understanding someone else's script because everyone has a different way of approaching things. Um, so one of some of the things that I do, I I actually. If I'm really trying to like, if I have like, I'm in the weeds, I have no idea what this person is trying to do, I'll comment everything out and like uncomment it line by line and build it up and like have print statements, like just put print statements everywhere to just figure out like what in the world this thing is doing. And that has been really helpful for me, just like literally breaking it down and putting it back together. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, I struggle with that a lot, and sometimes I still struggle with it. Um, what I always try to do is figure out what's the basic command that the script is using, because all scripts are using at least one command, oftentimes many of them. But I always try to look and see, like, what's the first or the most basic command, and then I actually go read the manual. Um, if you open up your terminal window and you type man, M-A-N, short for manual, not for dude, uh, man into the manual space um, and then the name of the command and that gives you like the syntax of of that command so that for me it helps explain like all of these dashes and all these like random like brackets um, so I, I really I really encourage people to read the manuals of things um, if if that's your style I don't read manuals for doing anything else but I do read them for um, for like syntax with with different commands and this is Diane again. They, I just I was thinking of something as Jarrett was speaking. Um, this is going to sound ridiculous, but maybe it might help someone. One of the first assignments I got as in a programming class was take some take a take a you know short program and retype it yourself because there's something in the translation when you actually have to like type it in yourself like something clicks in my brain. I'm just like oh that's what they were trying to do. So. Just just a thought in case that helps anyone else out. I know it's easy to copy and paste, but sometimes I will actually literally retype things to get a sense of what's happening. Okay, I see this question. Um, so you went from the text file to the rest of the EAD. Okay, so what happens in between? Um, is that, uh, and I can I can post a link here, or actually maybe I'm pretty sure it's linked from the Big Curator site, but I can I can post it here after my after I make this comment. Um, we convert that text file into a CSV file, and then convert that into an Excel file, and then convert that into XML using a style sheet. So um, that sounds like a lot of transformations, and it is, but it actually happens in a matter of minutes. So. That's the – and our documentation for, um, for how we add description includes specific steps, um, and that's, that's publicly posted. So um, I'll, uh, I'll retrieve that, and I'll put it here in this, in this box. And, and I also say that it's open. The documentation is open not because it's good, but because we want to be transparent. And I do want to get to a point where we're making fewer transformations of data. I'm just going to read this out loud for the recording purposes. But there's another question uh, from Yale. Um, has anyone tried to 
Has anyone tried writing a script to automate the bulk extractor tool over a number of disk images? Any thoughts or insights? Um, so that's, yeah, for, for anybody on the call. Um, I have definitely not done that. This is Walker, but I just want to add that that's something I'm uh, definitely anticipating writing or, or downloading in the future um, because we're, we're uh, for our workflow here is to kind of do layers and in batches and um, and the bulk bulk extractor layer is is one that's on the horizon. Uh, um, this is Jared. I'll just state that uh, Ben Goldman asked this question uh, on the Big Trader list last year or the year before. I can't remember. Uh, and Cam actually responded with a very quick, uh, uh, excellent script to do that. Um, and so I don't, I don't know if Cam wants to, to talk about it, but we've we've been using it since, um, and it works it works uh, amazingly. And I think that's a great candidate to like add to that to that resource that that uh, that we're introducing. So um, yeah, I can say something about that. Uh, that you know, that I've, I think I had mentioned on a couple of calls before or previously that that you know those are some of these things are actually not particularly difficult to do for someone with a lot of prior scripting experience, right? So uh, a lot of the times it just comes down to having the right question, and at that point, that was the right question. So, um, you know, uh, sort of bringing more of these questions to the forefront is, is you know, potentially a way to get some of these scripts, uh, you know, particularly for scripts that go into the, uh, into the wiki or into the training materials uh, that might help people kind of get a, get a good grasp on what's going on and, um, some of these automation procedures is, is not tough to do as long as we have those questions. Um, I will say that I, I should add something else um, since that was a little rambly. Um, one of the reasons that, you know, you, you look on some of the, at, at some of these scripts that people post online to, to attack a particular problem, and, and, and sometimes when you look at the bash syntax and it's particularly obfuscated or it's particularly difficult to understand the line, it's not necessarily uh, because that's how Bash is, or because that problem is particularly difficult. Sometimes it's because the person wrote a really bad Bash script, right? <laughs> and, and this is something that comes up on uh, Stack Overflow a lot. So if you if you look up, try to look up answers to the to issues you have, like specific types of uh, text manipulation or file manipulation issues on Stack Overflow, you'll often find people arguing about the correct way to do it. And you know, and, and the, because of the nature of that site, the the uh, the uh, uh, so the high quality uh, methods tend to filter up to the top since they get uploaded. Um, so I'd, I'd just add a, you know, since people have probably, most people who have tried to do this have already probably looked up um, things on, on Stack Overflow, but it's often a good way to, uh, to, find, uh, to find kind of more optimal approaches uh, to, to some of those problems. Um, I see uh, a question from Dorothy. Um, it says, totally appreciate your comments about dependency hail. Can you explain a little more about how working in the command line can help you avoid that? Um, so it can help avoid it because there could probably, one could probably write um, like Java-based programs, and there are, you know, Java-based programs that can do um, a, a lot of, uh, they, they string together different commands, but, um, I feel like using a command line interface is just like communicating directly with your computer. Um, and there are some, some command line, I mean, so for instance, one of the things that um, uh, uh, someone just asked about the uh, running, running a script over a set of disk images, um, that requires, that assumes that Firewalk is installed, which is the case in Victorator. Right, um, but it's not the case in, 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 other, in other environments necessarily. So. Um, I, but I just think the the less mediation that um, archivists and librarians can have, the better. I mean, you'll always be depending on some level of like representation, um, but I, I think that it, it can just help minimize like relying on certain installations of things. I was reading um, this really funny like story. Actually, it wasn't funny. It's pretty miserable. 
account of someone stuck in dependency hell. And like I've had those experiences when it's like, oh, use this thing. Oh, but you also need this thing. Oh, and then you need that thing. Oh, and then you need that thing. It's like you're going somewhere to buy something, and you went there to buy one thing, and you walked out with like, you know, bags and bags worth of stuff. And you're like, I didn't even want to buy all this stuff. I just wanted like a bag of like oranges. So um, it's just I think the less mediation, the better. Any other questions out there? Got about three minutes to one, though. We can definitely bleed over a little bit. Um, any other thoughts? So again, um, both Diane and Dietrich, uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your experiences um, and and already starting to work on a, a new resource um, that I think will be really useful and valuable for a lot of people um, that are just getting started. Um, and yeah, we are we are in discussion and conversations about a, a second part uh, to this webinar, which will be much more sort of tutorial, uh, hands-on, um, uh, to go from sort of getting a sense of where Diane and Jared got started and more towards how other other people out there uh, can get going as well um, with doing scripting to, to deal with certain tasks um, and use cases. So um, we don't have an exact date for that uh, right now, um, but uh, you know, we want to put some time and effort into it to make it really worthwhile. So uh, we'll definitely um, get, get some messages and announcements about that uh, when we have a better sense of the timeline, hopefully by perhaps uh, late summer or so. So um, yeah, if, you know, we'll, we'll follow up this webinar with a little brief survey like we've done before. So please chime in if you, you felt like this was a, a valuable, um, valuable topic um, and way of presenting things. Uh, always look forward to, to feedback from you all in ways that the, the BCC can help support your your work with the curator and and forensics so thanks again for everybody for attending and hope everyone has a nice weekend thank you.